it, it gives me particularly great pleasure to welcome back Jonathan Bowden, our, our esteemed chairman, and who's been the uh, closing speaker at so many of these meetings over the years, and who's going to talk to us this afternoon about Ezra Pound. Uh, Ezra Pound probably needs no more introduction than Jonathan Bowden to this group, unlike some of the more <laughs> obscure authors who have been discussed in the past. Uh, it, it's certainly an interesting feature of 20th century intellectual life. There, there is a belief that all intellectuals of any significance are or were on the left. Uh, and it is certainly true that the majority in the last century probably were, but, but not, I think, the best. I tried to call who it was remarked that in a study done during the Spanish Civil War uh, of who was taking which side, uh, all but about six of the intellectuals' questions supported the Republican side, and only six supported the New Spain, as it was called. But they happened to include men such as Pound, Wyndham Lewis, T.S. Eliot, some of the greatest minds of their age, instead of the uh, array of rather mediocre, predictable leftists supporting the Republicans. It might be said the really original minds uh, were on the nationalist side. And this afternoon, we have one of those original minds back in good form to address us all. And so I ask you all to give a warm round of applause to welcome Jonathan back. Right, well, thanks very much. It's nice to be back. Um, this talk, as it says on the tin, is about Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound had a long life and was about 87 when he died. He was born in 1885 and died, I think, on the 1st of November, 1972. What I'll do is I'll start by reading a poem that Pound wrote about the First World War and its effect upon that generation, which was known as Hugh Selwyn Mor Morbally, and was written in around 1920. Part four of these interconnected stanzas that make up the work. These fought, in any case, and some believing, pro domo, in any case, some quit to arm, some for adventure, some from fear or weakness, some from fear of censure, some for love of slaughter in imagination, learning later, some in fear, learning love of slaughter, died some pro patria, non dulce non et deco, walked I deep in hell, Believing in old men's lies, then unbelieving. Came home, home to a lie, home to many deceits, home to old lies and new infamy, usury, age old and age thick, and liars in public places. Daring as never before, wastage as never before, young blood and high blood, fair cheeks and fine bodies, fortitude as never before, Frankness as never before, disillusions as never told in the old days, hysterias, trench confessions, laughter out of dead bellies. Part 5. There died a myriad, and of the best among them, for an old bitch gone in the teeth, for a botched civilization. Charm, smiling at the good mouth, quick eyes gone under earth's lid for two gross of broken statues, for a thousand battered books. That's one of the more powerful and direct poems, or part of an overall poem, written by Pound, who was highly disillusioned by the Great War and the slaughter which eventuated. Indeed, it led for, to his break culturally with this country, which he'd lived in from around the turn of the 20th century. I think to give the talk some spine, it's best to uh, adumbrate and look at the chronology of Pound's life. You have the birth in the United States to an establishmentarian family with Republican political connections and um, quite a prosperous family in, a, in the 1880s. You have the move to scholarship and to study English literature and medieval literature in particular, uh, an obsession with the troubadour tradition and the poetry of the late Middle Ages and a certain suppressed erotic and or other currents in European art. You have the move to Europe and teaching Polytechnic, various roundabout institutions, the writing for small magazines and small poetry journals, the befriending of almost every poet and or artistic intellectual who came to prominence during that period. 
Pound being a sort of unofficial clearinghouse and university uh, for culture, the disillusionment in the wake of the Great War, the turning to the continent thereafter, the living in France from 1921 to 1925, and subsequently Italy from 1925 until 1945, the gradual increasing political radicalization throughout the late 20s, 30s and 40s, after all he was living in Mussolini's Republic. After 1945, imprisonment by the American authorities, the option to uh, execute Pound for treason to the American Republic as designated, the option of life imprisonment, both of which were very real possibilities. Don't believe the rather tendentious and journalistic comment of the present time that says that Pound was really in no danger, the Americans would never have put one of the most foremost poets to death. There was a very real prospect of both execution and or life imprisonment, probably a slightly greater prospect of the second possibility. In the end, of course, he was institutionalized at, since, at St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital between 1948 and 1958. He then returns to Italy, 1958, through to the end. So you have that spine of the life, which, uh, given that it was quite a complicated and diverse life, is uh, best to keep in mind. Why was Pound regarded as an artistic revolutionary? Why is he inescapable from poetic modernism in the 20th century? Why hasn't he been dumped and binned because of his political affiliations? The reasons are essentially his concern with purity in language and the belief in the consolidation of literary forms and the compression of ideas into a smooth and unemotionally slithered diction which he called imagism and which was to affect most of the poets of his era, including W.B. Yeats, who he befriended. I think uh, Olivia Shakespeare, who was a flame of Yeats, had a daughter called Dorothy, who he later married. Uh, Pound was always rather complicated in his inf uh, emotional and private life entanglements. He essentially had two families. He sort of had a Mark I wife, Dorothy Shakespeare. He had a Mark II wife, uh, Olga Rose, and he had children, Omar and Mary, by both. And there are also other various mistresses as well. Pound once boasted that he'd been in Paris for three months and yet had to acquire a mistress, when he already had essentially quasi-bigamous relations with two women and two family groups. So this is the sort of attitude that he had in this area, to which in some ways he may not have given that great an importance, because artistic, cultural, and intellectual things always came first with Pound. It's important to realise that the culture that grows up after the Second World War is completely distinct to the culture that existed before it. Uh, poets were rock stars and were treated as such in the immediate pre-war period. Their doings, their mistresses, their outrageousness, their living against the conventions of bourgeois society were all considered to be integral to the poet's art. Pound advocated a revolutionary poetics that gradually grew upon him from the first decade of the 20th century on and was associated with poets like Hilda Doolittle, better known by her initials HD, Virago published Hilda Doolittle's poetry, Amy Lau, and various other people. He was also associated throughout the century with very, very major writers who would later campaign against his execution and imprisonment, whatever they thought of his political affiliations. These are people like Robert Frost, and above all, Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway's very plained down, minimalist style, this sort of adoption of a Shaker diction in literature, um, Shakerism being an American Protestant cult where everything is simplified down to concrete essentials, they're most famous for their furniture. Shakers used to dance with each other rather than have sexual intercourse, men and women, which is why their sect died out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Pound was very much a, uh, a product of the Protestant North of the United States and remained, in a sense, a proud Yankee of independent birth and tradition. Many of his political positions are actually based on preceding incarnations of the American Republic, and this becomes increasingly evident during his life and during his work. The middle and the latter stages of his career are dominated by the Cantos, which, are po which is an enormous po poetical book published in a series of stages, uh, and including fragments that were published after 1969 as a sort of addendum to the same. Now, the cantos are his middle and late career. Other books, like Cathay and so on, are part of his early period. But what you see in all of his work is a concern with purity of tone, purity of pitch, solemnity and dignity of diction, the planing down of language, and in some ways, uh, a slightly Eastern use of Western language. 
which led him to explore Japanese and Chinese literature at a time that were virtually unknown outside of tiny sinological specialities and specialised university departments. Howe's poetry is very academic at one level and visceral at another. Um, Philip uh, Larkin once criticised Pound in a post-war way by saying he made poetry out of literature rather than out of life. And it is true that Pound's poetry is fiendishly difficult. Um, the Cantos explores 15 languages, multi-dimensional realities, the idea of a hell that we're all in, a group of people that wishes to transcend that, and find, if you like, a terrestrial paradise, and enormous amounts of economic and political law, particularly in relation to the social credit theories of Douglas, that transfixed power from the 1920s, apparent from the 1920s onwards, and led him to believe that solutions to Western economic privation in the 30s were ready and were to hand. Now, Pound basically believed in a sort of cultural organisation. He believed in telling people what to write, how to read, what they should be reading. He managed to make sure that many of his associates were published and were put into galleries. He uh, was extraordinarily important in the launching of the career of Wyndham Lewis, and in later theoretical and linguistic terms taken by W.B. Yeats. He launched an enormous, a large number of poetical magazines which wouldn't have existed without him, and major works in the 20th century would never have been published without Pounds, either as an editor, or as a midwife, or as a publisher's assistant, or somebody who even paid for the thing to be published in the first instance. The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, and most of T.S. Eliot's early poetry, he believed Eliot had modernised himself and got rid of romantic and, plus, and um, what Pound considered to be a feat diction. Uh, he planed down language to a modernistic uh, I I absence of excess and would not have been published without Pound's intervention. Ulysses by James Joyce would probably not have been published without Pound's intervention. Um, Wyndham Lewis's Tar would not have been published without Pound's intervention. So Pound was extraordinarily important in fostering other talent. Artists are extraordinarily reluctant to support other artists because they're always involved in competition with each other. And there's a degree to which Pound was very unusual in his underground university attitude towards culture. This also went with his anti-democratic or elitist views. Pound basically believed in the absence of what has come to pass. He believed in a hostility to mass society, to mass entertainment, to mass infotainment, for the pop culture that emerged in and around and after the Second War, but was preceded by the Jazz Age in the 1920s as a sort of precursor of same. So uh, decadent mass culture, in a sense, has three variants. The 1890s, an upper-class <coughs> version of it, the 1920s, a bourgeois version of it, and a blowout period after the excesses and privations of the Great War and thereafter, and the 1960s, when these mass countercultural energy, energies become both mass bourgeois in orientation and also become proletarianised. So what has actually occurred, Pound opposed from the moment of its inception. Pound believed that artists and writers and intellectuals and those associated with them had a mission to raise the level of the masses and to raise the level of mass culture. That culture, or that the artistic implementation of culture was a mould that the jelly of society should be made to fit. This led him in opposition to the idea that life is economically based and that all that matters is economic preferment and that material good and material success is all that's important. And of course during this period the rise of commercialism which now accedes to a totalitarianism and is all around us was that which Pound and many other writers of the right or the radical right laid into. Pound was part of a generation that believed that Europe was dying and would either continue down to death or would be reborn. He hoped for the latter, and he saw in Mussolini's type of politics an adoption of the mechanisms and modalities of social credit. Now, social credit is an alternative economic set of theories put forward by Major Douglas. Some compare it to Keynesian economics, although Keynes violently repudiated that. The criticism of both Douglas and Keynes that their systems are inflationary uh, was held by Douglas of Keynes and Keynes of Douglas. Um, <laughs> interestingly, these are not just theories because there is an attempt to implement these theories. In Alberta, 
there was an attempt at a social credit regime. And social credit I ideology cannot just be dismissed as fanciful, um, beyond left-right posing, and a desire to put poets in charge of the national economy. I remember the Nicaraguan Sandinistas put a poet in charge of the national economy after they achieved power in that small Latin American society. The economy, economy subsequently collapsed. <laughs> Hostile critics in The Economist and other journals blamed this on putting a poet in charge of the national finances. They blamed it, of course, on the widespread sanctions which the, national, which the United States was then inflicting on a tiny, impoverished Latino society. Nevertheless, social credit is, in all probability, a reasonably acceptable sketch for an alternative type of economics. Powell invest, uh, Pound invested it with holy writ and really did believe that there was the prospect of building a social credit society where money served the consumer and served the producer and where the middleman based uh, upon usurious interest bearing profit without work or prior motivation could be cut out. This drew both Douglas to a minor degree and Pound in a much more lurid and extravagant and artistically extreme way into what we might call politely the rejection of philo-Semitism, <laughs> which in Pound's case became more and more lurid and more and more extreme as the 30s and the 40s continued. Pound was a brave man and was prepared to suffer for his ideas and uh, was driven to a certain extent. If you consider that he was, in many ways, a one-man dynamo, because he contradicted the establishment into a minor element of which in the United States he'd been born himself. On most major fronts in the 20th century, he opposed the literary and cultural values of the pre-Second World War and post-First War establishment. He opposed neo-Edwardianism and traditional romanticism in verse and sought for a modern alternative. He opposed economic and social doctrines which were widely prevalent at the time. He had a look at certain forms of authoritarian socialism uh, in socialist and alternative magazines like the New Age, which he wrote for in the second decade of the 20th century, edited by the occultist or the occult interested <coughs> writer A.R. Orridge. Um, he explored ideas of re-evaluation and currency reform and economic transformation of Western societies to get rid of the merchant and to get rid of the trader and to get rid of the banker and to get rid of the financier as the major arch or linchpin for that which existed. It's not that these societal models and roles didn't have any veracity whatsoever, it's that Pound believed that they should not be central to a culture or a civilization. Otherwise, the values inherent in a culture will rot away. Usury, which is what he used to describe this sort of debt-based finance capitalism, which is the system which prevails, which is the system that has worked, stroke not worked, which has staggered on throughout the 20th century with recurrent crises, seeing off its state socialist, authoritarian socialist, and in some respects, social democratic rival models. How realistic the models were and are is difficult to determine. Certainly, probably, Douglas's solutions would be inflationary uh, as neoliberal and libertarian and laissez-faire economists redirected and come around again via the, via the Austrian school and the Chicago Business School would attest. But there is a degree to which many of these theories have never been properly pl uh, applied and even if Keynesianism is in some ways a diluted or a differentiated version of Douglas's ideas, these ideas were used to pilot the Western economy through most of the 50s, most of the 60s and most of the 70s. They then fell into disuse and were upturned by the Thatcher and Reagan economic and political revolutions partial revolutions of the 1980s. Pound lived until 72 and advocated maximal reform in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. Pound was the most politically active poet since William Blake. In an average year he wrote a thousand letters to various administrators, statesmen and senior politicians. He was always berating politicians and he always sought personal contact with them. Just as with the artistic community when he arrived as a young student, sort of American immigrant, in and around the turn of the latter years of the first decade of the 20th century, Pound went directly to source. If he wanted to meet the putative imagists like A. Bilal and Hilda Doolittle, he would go and do so. If he wanted to meet W.B. Yeats and become his secretary, then he would go and introduce himself and offer his services as a putative amanuensis. If he wanted to meet revolutionary artists like Wyndham Lewis, he would go and do so. There was a cafe, stroke bistro, 
uh, run by a Hungarian restaurateur in New Oxford Street called the Eiffel Tower, which was the restaurant where they all used to meet. And after Imagism and Amy Lau's sort of cannibalization of that idea, Pound moved away from that and towards a different conception of art called Vorticism, which he developed in association with Gordia Bresca and Wyndham Lewis. They used to meet in the Eiffel Tower, and there's a well-known painting of the Vorticist with Pound in the corner with a cravat and earring and the, the usual sort of, um, sort of post-Raphaelite look, if you can put it put it in that way. Lewis dominating the whole group with his enormous Spanish sombrero and cape and various of the other various of the other artists and writers who were associated with that tendency of opinion. Blast, which was meant to be aggressive rather than passive and was meant to be expressive and anti-romantic, didn't really survive the First World War but was an enormous magazine with pink covers and modernist abstractions and militaristic themes on the cover and uh, was as big as the London phone directory. It was an enormously thick volume <coughs> in which various tendencies were blasted or alternately blessed. Now, Pound became the most notorious poet of the 20th century through a concatenation of forces. Certainly on the 26th of July, 1943, he was in absentee, indicted for treason by the American government. And this was for broadcast which he made on Mussolini and state radio. The Italians were reluctant to allow Pound on the, to the radio. He had to fight for, for, for quite a long time until they allowed me near that damn microphone, <coughs> as he would have said. And when Pound got into the studio, Pound's voice was quite peculiar. The BBC occasionally play some of Pound's um, sort of cylinders, I suppose, or um, pre-33 and a third sort of 78 recordings, uh, play cylinder type recordings, which were taken down by, I think, the University of Philadelphia or maybe the University of Pennsylvania, which was the listening station of the United States government to foreign broadcasts. Uh, Hoover Augur Hoover ordered a special file to be created on Pound, this traitor, who he intended to deal with after the Second World War. The passion that the Pound case involved is difficult to understand in contemporary terms. Arthur Miller wrote a, a long article in which he speculated upon the tortures that he would like to see inflicted on Pound prior to execution, and this was published in the published prints. The emotions that were generated by the traitor Ezra whom was described by Miller as worse than Goebbels, uh, who knew how to appeal to every American strand of prejudice. Um, but most of these broadcasts were never heard, but they were certainly heard by the American elite and by the American cultural elite. The irony is that Pan had so many friends culturally from Hemingway down that he was awarded the Bollingen Prize by the Library of Congress um, immediately after the Second War, which caused absolute outrage in the United States and led to, to uh, one congressman to describe it as giving a prize for a man who, who uses words as maggots. So America has always dealt with those that it believes to be treasonable in a very uh, straightforward way, primarily by stringing them up, and uh, by, a ro by a rope party, as it's called. And um, Pound fell just short of such a rope party. If it had not been for his lawyer, campaigning for an insanity plea immediately post-war, he would have probably faced life imprisonment. And if it had not been for the enormous number of prominent artists and writers, people like William Carlos Williams, people like E. e. Cummings, people like Robert Frost, people like Ernest Hemingway, many of whom had no time for Pound's political views, if it had not been them for them campaigning on his behalf, he could well have had a much stickier end. Pound broadcast until the Americans invaded Italy after Operation Torch, which saw the operation of uh, the uh, organised landings in Sicily and in the southern toe of Italy, and the general movement of uh, Western and Allied armies up against German and Italian troops, uh, aided and assisted by partisans, most but not all of whom were communists. Uh, Pound was arrested by partisans, and he slipped a copy of Confucius, uh, or a small volume of Confucius's thought, extremely socially conservative Chinese thought, which had always influenced Pound, both poetically and politically, into his pocket. He probably expected to be shot. Uh, the partisans had killed the Mussolini's a day or two before. But interestingly, the uh, partisans seemed to know who he was and knew that American intelligence wanted to interview him. The interesting thing was he was released initially into the care of his family and was then taken back into American custody. The second phase of American custody was the most climactic. Uh, 
because in Pisa he was put in the death cells, as they were called. The death cells were six foot by six foot steel cells. Um, pictures exist on the Wikipedia uh, pages devoted to West Rapan, and they're worth looking at if people have a minute to bring them up. Um, he had little water, few toiletries, there was no um, belt allowed, there was no shoelaces allowed, threat of suicide of course, through the barrier cages, the bars of the cage. These penal colonies and these death cells were primarily pursuant to struggles inside the United States Army, uh, particularly racial and political struggles. Um, whenever the US has gone to war before the accession to civil rights in the late 1960s, you have struggles within all American armies. It goes without saying that the bulk of the prisoners in these maximal and ultra institutions for infractions of American rules and military discipline would be African Americans, many of whom were on death row waiting to be hanged by the US Army internally. It is not an accident to suggest, as certain black nationalists in the 1960s would have suggested in the United States, that many African American troops were at war with their own army and the war was not from their point of view against Germans or against Japanese or against Italians or against people who were fighting along with the Axis powers of other nationalities but was primarily against the US government. Most African Americans always oppose American wars abroad by virtue of the fact that they regard, like Obama's wife, their own country as the chief enemy. Pound was put in this cell for two and a half weeks and gradually either went partially mad or did go mad for a short period. Uh, he was in extreme heat. You were denied all cultural stimulation and the guards were told not to talk to the prisoners. The only individual you could actually communicate with was the chaplain. There is a lot of evidence that's, that, can, that um, Canto 86, I believe, was started in the prison <coughs> cells because he started the prison uh, cantos, one of the most famous sections of the cantos overall, in the death cell which shows a sort of mental resilience um, and a commitment to culture even in the harshest conditions when he either faced insanity, death, being left in the death cell until there was literally nothing left. It was only when he was um, interviewed and assessed by a psychiatrist that he was taken out of the death cells and put in medical confines. He then was interviewed by J. Edgar Hoover's personal representative who'd opened a file on him in 1943 pursuant to the treason trial which would occur. The attempt by his literary friends to have him uh, declared insane was essentially a ruse or a cultural route that was adopted primarily though, to save his sanity basically <coughs> and his life. Whether Pound actually crossed the line into partial insanity at certain times at St Elizabeth's where he was incarcerated in a mental institution for 10 years between 1948 and 1958 uh, is difficult to determine. Certainly, Pan was driven, and he once said uh, that Wyndham Lewis, his old friend, was pursued by the Furies, but Pan himself was, in certain respects, a man who was pursued by the Furies. The Cantos, which is uh, as thick as a sort of telephone directory, um, and which is published by Faber in Faber in Britain, is a strange work because it has no ultimate plot or overall structure, rather like Pan's work, which tends to be a cluster of heightened images often pared down, involving enormous cultural resource of language, where I, one idea suggests another one somewhat effortlessly, and where you have to, rather like with Blake, realise that an internal world, an internal soundscaping language, a visual world in many ways, and a highly cultured one, is being illuminated in tropes and in artistic configurations. That's the only way really to read Pound. It doesn't have an obvious narrative sense. It all associates with the need for a, reserve, a renewal in culture, the extraordinary importance of the troubadour, uh, the heightened medieval and the classical tradition of the ancient world, the importance of culture to be raised over money in all areas of national life, the importance of the past in the present and the future, but the commitment to the future and the commitment to an explicitly modern future, but not the modern future that we live in now. Pound's growing disgust at the forces which he believed held back art and civilization and were planning for a new war. One of Douglas's uh, ideas, much more radical than Keynes in this respect, is that a debt-laden economy which needs endlessly to spend in order to produce 
and then clear more and more debt which in turn will be spent through seeing a circular way leads to war. He believed the control of economies by bankers and financial capitalist institutions and the subordination of industrial and agricultural productivity to same will lead to war, what the extreme left in the 1960s called the welfare warfare state. These are sorts of statements which were made by Marxist and Frankfurt School intellectuals like Herbert Marcuse in books like Wonder <coughs> Woman Man in the late 1960s. Now, because of course, radical right and extreme left share certain assumptions or share certain ideas if they radically critique finance capitalism in particular and the nature of a contemporary economic order. Pam was never an orthodox conservative and was essentially opposed to liberalism, except in the humanistic sense, except in the sense of a wide and deep educatedness. Other than that, he was opposed to liberalism in politics and believed in enlightened aristocracy and rule of the t by the talented few. He was opposed to liberal enlightenment views in culture because he believed in a culture-bearing strand and elite which fed down into the masses and tried to raise them up to the level that they could reach given their natural aptitudes and abilities. And he was also opposed to money choosing the politicians that one has. In most Western societies, you have two blocks, as everyone here knows, one representing bourgeois electoral power, one representing working class electoral power. They occasionally overlap in the centre, but they basically vie with each other to manage the system best as boards, but increasingly are powerless in relation to the money that seems to determine both their ideas, their foreign policies, and even the personnel of the, that runs these parties. It, it was increasingly difficult to say whether contemporary politicians actually run these societies. The left-wing concepts of the ruling class that doesn't rule, the sort of rudderless ship, that a system that, has a, that is a process in and of itself, are developments which occurred after Pound's death. But what he critiqued in the 1930s, particularly with the Roosevelt administration, which you could argue had moved via the New Deal to Keynesian demand management and to certain forms of radical economic activity and initiative, very unusual for an American regime, which might be to Pound's liking. But Pound saw a poisonous relationship between the United States and the rest of the planet. While not strictly speaking an isolationist, Pound was a European American in the most radical of senses. Pound believed that American culture was an extension of European culture, not the other way around. And he also believed that Americans should contribute to Europe and to the glory and continuity of European culture as represented by the still living and extant cultural spaces of Italy and Greece. A romantic of the European South, uh, Pound believed that the task of great writers and intellectuals was to lead people and was to instill in people a belief in the glory of their civilization, something which you know, almost all contemporary artists have given up on. Pound remains uniquely controversial in 20th century letters, and no matter how many little magazines he founded, no matter how many poets that he led to uh, uh, being published, no matter how many artists he got into galleries, no matter how important his own work, the politics that he became associated with is what has doomed him in the eyes of the culture-bearing strata. Although there's a degree to which, because modernism in letters, can, in the English language at any rate, cannot exist without him, there is a degree to which Pound remains cardinal to the poetic experience in the 20th century. This is why Every modern literature course in any British or American university or further afield has Ezra Pound as a key item within it. But Pound can only be talked about in hushed tones and in tones which attempt to apologise for his past, liberally, revisionistically explain away his past, or honestly confront his past, as in John Title's autobiography, uh, biography of Pound, without necessarily belabouring the criticism too much because academics can get away with a certain specious objectivity. The title's book is quite interesting actually because it is a liberal confrontation with Pound which doesn't duck the political questions at all. Um, this is John Titles, Ezra Pound, he also wrote a book on the Beat Generation. Um, one of the most famous biographies of Pound of course is written by Eustace Mullins, um, the quite well-known right-wing currency reformer, advocate of alternative economics, conspiracy <coughs> theorist, and American writer in the post-war era. These friendships which he had with people like John Casper and with Eustace Mullins would be held against Pound and were indeed used as a way of preventing him from leaving St. Elizabeth's mental hospital until 1958, 
Ernest Hemingway always campaigned for pounds released, gave him a thousand pounds on the, the moment he got out of St. Elizabeth and went back to Europe. When Pound returned to Europe, the first gesture he did when he got off the boat was to give in front of waiting journalists who were there to receive him, was to give the fascist salute. <laughs> <laughs> and said to the, he said, I've left America, and America is an insane asylum. <laughs> Everyone in America is mad. So by leaving America, I have left an asylum. Um, so uh, anti-Americanism <coughs> didn't uh, begin with Pan, but it certainly didn't end with him. And yet he would actually proclaim himself to be a proud American, loyal to Republican and Federalist ideas, which go back to the founding of the Republic, the belief in honest work, the belief in standards of family and behavior, the belief in a post-European culture and identity in the Americas, a belief in hard work, a belief in the frontier ethics, a belief in the sort of lumberjack sort of ideal of the United States, which is not corrupted and polluted by fiscal capitalism. In some ways, he wants a simple, ruralist, idealized US, which is like a sort of rather machismo version of the Little House on the Prairie. It's a, a, an actual fact there's a degree to which William Pierce's ideas at the end about the sort of America he would like are very similar to what Pound advocated for his own society. One of the very interesting paradoxes of contemporary life is that America is the most postmodern society, the most hyper-real society, the most fiscally based and fiscally driven society, the society that dominates all the others, even to the degree that communist China and India, despite their new preeminence, are basing their models upon the American model. This society is so Americanized to the degree that, with the sole exception of not speaking with an American diction and using technically the American form of English, we have become an America here. This is the 51st state without almost any doubt, and our culture is so seamlessly intertwined with that of the United States that it's even regarded as slightly blasphemous to say so because it's so ingrained that people accept that without thinking. And yet, the most radical criticisms by people like Lawrence R. Brown, by people like Revelo P. Oliver, by people like William Parker Yockey, by people like Pound in his books, ABC of Economics, um, How to Read, How to Write, Who One Should Be Reading, Mussolini or Jackson, um, and many of his non-fiction works, he wrote an enormous amount of journalism and an enormous amount of general non-fiction prose to go with the poetry. All of these works are produced by Americans. It's as if America has a radical cultural split between those who accept everything that Americanism is in its contemporary terms and those Americans who reject Americanism and claim to be the most American of all. It's important to realize that the most extreme indigenous bluegrass socially conservative politicians in the United States, people like David Duke and so on, are the ones that advocate the end of an American empire and isolation. Even more moderate and slightly more credible candidates to a certain extent like Patrick J. Buchanan. And one of these candidates always stands in every presidential election on the margins. They get 2% in certain states and so on. And uh, most people who would otherwise vote for them vote Republican given the internal ethnic balance and complicated politics of the US per se, where the Republicans have become the repository for, uh, for white votes. It's quite clear. President Obama was elected because a third of the society, uh, in one way or another, looks the way he does. America's changed hand of all recognition in the last 30 to 40 years, something which largely Pound didn't live to see. But Pound's predictions in relation to what would happen in the world, recurrent wars, recurrent crises, recurrent instabilities for international fiscal capital based upon debt and usurious inheritance, is largely true uh, now, as much when he talked about it in the 20s and 30s. Pound is unusual in that as an artist, he should have no right to speak about these matters about which he could be presumed to know little. Um, cross the margin and cross the line into politics. One of the things about artists is that they will always choose extreme or radical political formulations if they cross the political line, because moderation doesn't come naturally to them. Also, thinking is an end in itself, politically, whereby one 
basically looks at a corpus of ideas and, if necessary, pushes the latent ideas within that system to the most radical margin or edge, is inevitable for people involved in artistic and intellectual life. This results either in the idea that people think intellectuals make incredibly bad politicians, and also a cult of anti-intellectuality amongst politicians, because if you thought out logically the semblance of logic that exists in your own programs, you might be invited to adopt radical solutions that would make you unelectable or would not pass various liberal filters in the media and elsewhere when you were asked about your own opinions. Most politicians, after all, lie about what their real opinions are, increasingly don't have any, increasingly don't think that politics is a vehicle for themselves to get on, and run against the interests of the people in the bloc that they were put there to represent in the first place. And this is considered to be normal politics. Miliband is now re-engineering new old Labour to be a party which he is and isn't proud to lead as he seeks the Liberal centrist votes that will bring Labour back. Cameron spent his entire position as an opposition leader denying he was a Conservative and saying he was an upper-class Liberal chap with terribly modern ideas, really, that didn't amount to much, that just happened to have wandered into leadership of the Tory party. <laughs> um, these are actually how our contemporary politicians behave. People like Pound are so extraordinary because they have no concern with that sort of tendentiousness at all. And this makes them either deluded idealists of the first water from the perspective of practical men, or refreshing idealists who push the envelope and who believe the truth lies in the margin, believes the truth lies at the extreme, that, the arrow, that in mathematics the arrow that crosses the circle is furthest out and X, the point where the line goes through the circle, is the most radical formulation of a proposition that you can have. Now, Pound recovered gradually and used St Elizabeth's Hospital as a sort of moral university. Most of his family, his two families, if you like, visited him there. Um, a large number of writers and intellectuals visited him there. Wyndham Lewis once complained that your strategic initiative in taking up residence in a lunatic asylum is not healthy. <laughs> and uh, although it was quite clearly the strategy which enabled him to survive uh, and prosper in the post-war world um, I'll read uh, another poem which is about usury and which is a very famous poem and I will do something I shall attempt to read it in the way Ezra Pound would have read it which may or may not be amusing <laughs> with usurer no picture is made to endure, nor to live with, but is made to sell, and to sell quickly. With usurer, sin against nature, is thy bread, evermore of stale rags, is thy bread dry as paper, and no man can find sight for his dwelling. Stone cutter is kept from his stone, weaver is kept from his loom. With usurer! Wool comes not to market, sheep bring not gain with usurer. Usurer rusteth the chisel, it rusteth the craft and the craftsman, it gnaweth the thread and the loom. Usurer slayeth the child in the womb, it stayeth the young man's courting, it hath brought, brought palsy to bed. Lieth between the young bride and her bridegroom, contra naturum. They have brought whores to Eleusius. Corpses are set to banquet at behest of usurer. So that's my... That's my <laughs> one, thing, one thing that I think always works with Pound is to put it into an American diction. Because although it's said the English and the, the British and the Americans are a uh, people divided by the common use of the same language, um, there is a degree to which his poetry does come alive when you put it in that American diction. Just on a technical point, American language is often more archaic than British English. And this at times, because it's more based on the authorised version. And if it, it can at times have certain primal qualities, it's no accident that a great number of the most foremost writers in English, in our general language, have been Americans. But they've been Americans that sought out the European destiny and believed that they should come here. Wyndham Lewis was Canadian-born, Ezra Pound was a Yankee-American, T.S. Eliot became more English than the English, but was, of course, an American by birth. And for all of them, there is a large number of other people, Amy Lowell and Anna Cavan and all sorts of other people, Juna Barnes and uh, Hemingway and so on, of a slightly lesser sort. Hemingway is actually slightly interesting, because Hemingway always supported Pound. 
And Hemingway said, in a thousand years, if literature is still read, Pound will be there. When he was asked about the friendship between the segregationist John Casper and Ezra Pound, uh, Casper would later be jailed for the bombing of a, a school uh, when there were no children there, who had de which had desegregated and who ran a radical right bookshop in Greenwich Village, of all places. <laughs> An area that's open to alternative ideas. Uh, one, of, one of the interesting things about the sort of radicalism that Pound re represented is that many people would have probably thought it was left-wing for quite a while, particularly the alternative economic ideas and the writing for socialist magazines like The New Age, and its association with Dorothy Shakespeare. One of, when I was a young man, I went to Paris for a couple of weeks, and on the left bank, there's Dorothy Shakespeare's bookshop called Shakespeare and Company, which is one of the most famous English language bookshop in Paris. It's a stone's throw away from Notre Dame. I think it's in the fifth arrondissement. It yes. And you can almost see the cathedral from the bookshop. It's a very shambolic sort of bookshop with books piled absolutely everywhere. It was run by a very aged, bearded Trotskyist in 1982, I think, when I was there. And he said, you'll be staying to tea because everyone who was there was invited to tea and you went upstairs. So in a sense it re retained its bohemian uh, qualities which it doubtless had in the era of Dorothy and Ezra. And no French books were sold there really, it was all in English. Kilometre zero, right in the centre of the city. Shakespeare and Company, kilometre zero, every book stamped with that particular marker, round cylindrical marker. And a lot of the books <coughs> that even hail from the 30s by Miller, by Hemingway and others are still on sale, some of them in original binding. Now, Dorothy Shakespeare's Egoist Press and the journal The Egoist, which Pound helped her with, um, published Lewis's Tar, I think may have published uh, Joyce's Ulysses as well. So Pound was always at the forefront of the radical use of language, no more so than in the cantos. And with the audience's indulgence and permission, I shall now read the beginning of the cantos. Pound is very difficult. Pound is very difficult to read. Pound is, relies upon an education which almost nobody in Western societies is now given, even at the most elite level. But my view is that that's the wrong way to read Pound. Most people, they come across in the third line a cultural association which they don't understand, maybe from the classical world, and they think, this isn't for me, you know, uh, I'm on the third line, I'm, all, I'm already lost, and they put it aside. But in actual fact, my view of, of writers like him, who use other cultural forms to think through, it's a shorthand for their own thinking, is not to be bothered about not getting the cultural reference. You continue with the work itself. So I would advise uh, anyone to get pound out of their local library and to have a look. Um, liberals say, irrespective of the politics and irrespective of the political radicalism. Now this is an early part, I wish to... Uh, We've got ten minutes. Right. Let's do this one. The pound. It's noticeable that nearly all political articles about pound, such as the article, the excellent article in Kerry Bolton's Thinkers of the Right, Changing Materialism, doesn't really concentrate on the poetics, which is very difficult and very technical. Liberals would have loved it if there had been no politics at all and no political overlay. Here's the first part of the cantos. Canto one. And then went down to the ship, set keel to breakers forth on the godly sea, and we set up mast and sail on that swart ship, bore sheep aboard her, and our bodies also, heavy with weeping. So winds from sternward bore, our, bore us out onward with belly in canvas. Sir says this craft, the trim coiffed goddess. Then sat we amidships, wing jamming the tiller, thus with stretched sail, we went over sea till day's end, sun to his slumber, shadows over the ocean. Came we then to the bounds of the deepest water, to the Cimmerian lands and peopled cities, covered with close webbed mist, unpierced river with glitter of sun rays, nor with stars stretched, nor looking back from heaven, swartest night stretched over wretched men there, the ocean flowing backward. Came we then to the place aforesaid by Circe. Here did they write Pyramides and Eurolycus, and drawing sword from my hip, I dug the L-square pitkin, poured we libations unto each the dead, first mead and then sweet wine, water mixed with white flour, 
Then prayed I many a prayer to the sickly death's heads, as set in Ithaca, sterile bulls of the best for sacrifice, heaping the pyre with goods, a sheep to Tiresias only, black and a bell shape. Dark blood flowed in the fosse, souls out of Erebus, cadaverous dead, of brides and of youths and of the old who had borne much, souls stained with recent tears, girls tender, men many, mauled with bronze lance heads, battle spoil, bearing yet dreary arms, these many crowded about me, shouting, and so forth. Now obviously at that particular beginning of the Cantate is based on Homer, and is based upon a sort of transcription or literary transliteration of Seneca. Many of his translations, which were very important in an era when many of the great poets had moved away from, from translation, from the Provençal, from the Troubadour tradition, from Japanese and Chinese art, from medieval poetry, romance and courtly love poetry, Troubadour poetry, and Anglo-Saxon literature, of which he had a great love, is very important. Pound's academic translations are still controversial. Many academics think he made many mistakes, and the translations are not literal. And probably in terms of language use, that's true. But certain Chinese writers have pointed out the extraordinary idiomatic quality of Pan's translation, his ability to enter into the spirit of the artist he's translating and do something called mimesis, whereby you actually ventriloquize and adopt their voice. So you leap dictions. And this led to his celebration of the ideogram. In Japanese poetry, there's the concept of the haiku, whereby you put things in a so concentrated a manner that really you compress a life or a momentous incident into four or five lines. It's the idea of added power through compression. And Pound wants to have the power due to the compression of the language which is used. Now, Ezra Pound, alive, 1885 to 1972, I would say that Pound delivered up his entire life for what Western civilization should be. He chose the most polit controversial political side that was then in existence and which he could have chosen. He thought little for himself and thought only for the uh, civilization of which he was a culture bearer. Pound is an example in a modern world of crass materialism and leveling absence of distinction, particularly intellectually. What is unpalatable about Ezra Pound is his opposition to the shibboleths that now dominate us, the belief in equality, the belief in mass uniformity, the belief that certain ideas are out of order and cannot be accepted, the belief that certain political and cultural trends are so unacceptable that they shouldn't even be discussed at the tertiary or university level. These are the things which Pound rebelled against all of his life. The other interesting thing in a, in a period when somebody that I've spoken of in these meetings before called Bill Hopkins has died recently, is the uh, approximately 83 years of age, is Pound's link to the most for the most uh, eternally minded and important artist and intellectuals of his time. The, far, the radical right is regarded as a trajectory that has no connection with civility or with art or with culture. It's a tendency connected to thuggery in the mass mind and in the mass media mind, whereas here you have exemplars of a civilization, people amongst the most significant individuals in their society, who in the end ended, ended up put in a death cage, in an American penitential death cage for the views which he espoused as a free man on Italian radio. So Pound was prepared to die and was prepared to suffer for his beliefs. These weren't just the crazy views of an intellectual who thought that he could put the world to rights. They were beliefs that he was prepared to die for. And if people are prepared to die for things, they're prepared to live for things. The West is in a very rocky stage at the present time, and although there is some evidence Pound became very depressed at the end of his life, there is still hope, and there's still a fortitude that exists here amongst Western people that a change in the next 50, 20 to 50 to 70 years is possible. My view is that one thing that people should always look at are the elite artists and intellectuals who've aligned themselves with European renewal. Educate yourself, read for yourself, read and make decisions for yourself, turn the television off and look at this sort of material. Ezra Pound is an example of Anglo-American intellectuality and poetic resourcefulness at a very high level. Even the, the critic George Steiner once said of Pound that he had an extraordinary ear, this ear for language. <laughs>
He believed that artists were the antennae of the race, the antennae of the race, and that they were there to lead other people towards a greater understanding of what it is to be human, a greater understanding of what you're going to experience before you die when you wonder whether your life's been worth anything or not. These are the sorts of areas that Pound wishes to reach into. So I would ask people to admire this man, not just because he had a political affiliation that people in this room would find much more acceptable than the average representative of Radio 4 culture, but also because he's an elitist of the best sort and a mind of the best sort that we rarely see today. A polymath, he was unafraid and he walked in a manner that led people to recognize that irrespective of his Americanism, this man was a European. Here goes a man, here goes a great European-American. I give you the memory of Ezra Pound, 1885 to 1972. Thank you very much. <laughs>